to you now, 50,000 indignant New Yorkers are inside and outside Madison Square Garden in a giant demonstration demanding the veto and defeat of the Taft-Hartley slave labor bill. Ladies and gentlemen, William Z. Foster. The Wall Street monopolists with their Taft-Hartley bill are trying to split and devitalize and hamstring the trade unions. The Taft-Hartley bill, moreover, would drastically limit the workers' right to strike. It would authorize the president to break national strikes. It would permit employers once again to use strike-breaking injunctions. Welcome to a special episode of Insurrection with Brenton Lengel. Uh, this this is uh, the Black and Red podcast. This is the third or fourth episode of this that I've done um, with uh, Marxist and journalist uh, Caleb Maupin. Um, hey, Caleb. Uh, so Caleb and I have known each other since Occupy Wall Street. And, um, you know, I'm an anarchist. He's a Marxist. Um, there's probably some sort of duet we could sing at some point, <laughs> but, um, yeah, we, he, uh, wanted to tell me about, uh, the life of, uh, one of the most famous, uh, Marxist politicians in the United States. Uh, but before we do get into that, I do want to let everybody know. Uh, so my comic, uh, Snow White Zombie Apocalypse, uh, the Ringo Award nominated series, we are launching uh, a Kickstarter to pay for the creation of issue three tomorrow. And I have, uh, I am like eight people away from breaking 200 followers on that. Uh, if you guys can throw me some mutual aid uh, and follow that Kickstarter because um, uh, the more I have before I launch, the, the better the almighty algorithm treats it. And, you know, it's a great comic with a lot of uh, feminist and revolutionary themes. So I'm going to put that link into the general chat. But Caleb, why don't you tell me who we're here to talk about? Well, it's interesting because, it, you know, this is a black and red podcast and William Z. Foster was a very, very prominent anarchist for many years. And then he went on to become what many people described as Mr. Communism in the <laughs> 1930s, 40s and 50s. So, uh, you know, he kind of I think that we'll both have a lot to say as we get into his life story, William Z. Foster. Um, and he's what's interesting is he's long forgotten, but he was a household name for decades. Um, you know, and he, his, you know, he would, he, you know, his, his life was covered in the New York times pages, you know, he would buy a new apartment and it would be a story in the New York times. Like this guy was very, very well known in his time, but he's kind of been forgotten as the cold war is, is behind us. So. Yeah, because I mean, I like to think I'm pretty knowledgeable about anarchist history, and to tell you the truth, I'd heard the name before this, but that that's about all I know about him. So you know, it's going to be interesting having you tell me his story, which sounds fascinating. Well, he was born in Taunton, Massachusetts, which is a small town near Boston, um, and his father was an Irish freedom fighter who had fled from Ireland uh, to run away from the British because he'd been involved in revolutionary Irish national liberation struggles. Um, but shortly after he was born, his family moved to Philadelphia, and it was an Irish Catholic family in Philadelphia, very working class and very poor. Um, he had, I believe, something like 10 brothers and sisters, um, and it was he grew up in a working class neighborhood, um, and he was actually involved in a street gang called the Bulldogs, uh, <laughs> kind of the street gang that he was involved in. And, um, you know, he was, a, he was a young working class guy in Philadelphia. His first uh, political act was to campaign for William Jennings Bryan, the populist who got the Democratic nomination. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, what was interesting was he was from a very, very Roman Catholic family. And this was at a time that Irish immigrants were very much discriminated against for being Roman Catholic. Um, so being Catholic was very much part of the Irish identity and that he said he grew up on a diet of Irish nationalism. His father was still very much fighting the Irish freedom struggle. They would go to Irish, uh, Irish national liberation support meetings, IRA support meetings as a kid. But yet in spite of all of that, William Z. Foster, you know, he did learn how to read. Um, and he started going to the Philadelphia public library and based on reading, he became a religious skeptic um, and became an atheist. Uh, he, you know, he oh no, all of the, <laughs> don't yeah. learn anything and then suddenly you'll become critical. Yeah. Of so you know, he was a free thinker and an independent thinker. Um, and you know, as he became an adult, he was, he worked a lot of different jobs. He was a longshoreman. He was a railroad worker. Um, you know, the first job he ever had is he was the assistant to a sculptor uh, and he would go and get supplies for a sculptor. Um, but one day, uh, I guess he was walking down the street and he heard a, a socialist, a member of probably the socialist labor party, uh, standing on a soapbox agitating. And so he stopped and he listened to the soapbox agitator and became convinced of their arguments, um, and decided to become a socialist. And wow. Like, like right there on the spot. Yeah. And, uh, apparently That's he argued with this and no one knows who it was. He has no idea who the guy was, but he, on the spot, he stopped, he listened to the guy. He argued with him for you know a little while and became convinced. He was living in Oregon at the time and he joined uh, the Socialist Party. And then shortly after that, he joined the Industrial Workers of the World, the Wobblies. Um, yep, this was around, IWW. around 1909. Um, and at the time, the main thing the Wobblies were doing was they had what they called free speech fights, uh, which was that in all these little towns, especially out West in Oregon, California, uh, Washington, Utah, Idaho, uh, there'd be a little town someplace and the IWW would go there and there'd be an IWW speaker who'd be giving a speech or there'd be an IWW person who would hand out leaflets and the town would arrest the person immediately and say, we have a ban on any socialist or radical agitating. And so then the word would go out and all the wobblies from all over the country would go to that one town and one by one get arrested until the town's jails were so crowded with people and the town had spent so much money and uh, you know some windows might get broken and some there might be some property damage also and the town would finally give in and say, all right, you can be a socialist agitator in this town. And they did this in town after town after town. And one of the places that it was probably the most intense was in Spokane, Washington. And William Z. Foster along with all kinds of wobblies, they went to Spokane, Washington and got arrested one by one, and uh, it was in the winter, it was freezing cold. Um, they, they used the schools of the town as jails, temporary jails. Oh, jeez. And they had no heat, in the, and it was just awful conditions. And William Z. Foster, you know, moved up the ranks of the IWW, um, and he started representing the Wobblies at international uh, labor gatherings. He became kind of their international spokesperson, and they would send him to Europe to represent them. Uh, so do you want to react to that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, first off, I think what I'm really excited about is his journey <laughs> to socialism kind of is the, the what year was this? 19. Uh, 1909. So that's like the 1909 version of my uh, conversion to anarchism because I, um, you know, uh, first found out about anarchism like on the internet. And as a as a red blooded American male, I was like, this can't be a thing. And uh, I proceeded to lock horns with and argue with um, a couple of anarchists, uh, one of whom uh, went on to become a Maoist, actually, and then later a um, uh, a um, PhD in economics. <laughs> um, and yeah, we're still friends to this day, actually. And, um, you know, I argued with those guys and I realized very quickly that what I had thought anarchism was, it wasn't. And I would have to learn about anarchism to actually have this argument and win. So I went and I did all this research and I learned about it and I came back and I won the damn argument. And then like, um, I would say a year, year and a half later, um, I was just, you know, I, I saw a number of factors came together in my life and I was just like, oh, they were right the whole time. <laughs> and so I, you know, changed my opinion, um, which very few people seem to do these days. So it, it's it's cool that, you know, um, essentially by engaging himself in the dialectic, he did the, uh, he did the, the old school way of <laughs> <laughs> of becoming a socialist uh, where the guy was literally like up there standing on a soapbox yelling. So I, no back then there was no TV back then, you know, and mm -hmm. that used to be a thing as people would set up their soapbox and go 
preach to the masses. And, you know, Union Square used to be famous for that. Every city had like a downtown area that was kind of known for if you wanted to hear radical ideas, go down there. And and uh, it worked. Um, That's why, by the way, in Union Square in New York, they've got all of the um, they, they added all the statues and all the landscaping because people used to gather there and hear radical speeches and stuff. And they wanted to cut down on the number of people that could actually go there. Um, yeah. So I, I would say, you know, that tracks the other thing that I, I, I love their tactic. Um, and also, um, what really tracks is the, the arrests, the, the, the public, um, civil disobedience, because I know like when I got arrested with Occupy Wall Street, one of the things is, is that when you do those kinds of events and you have those kinds of arrests, the cops usually overreact and they arrest a lot of people. And oftentimes they'll just scoop people up who weren't even necessarily part of the protest, but were just standing there or listening or whatever. And then those people spend hours in, in a jail cell with nothing to do but talk to activists. <laughs> and usually, um, you know, even in the 60s, we saw a lot of radical conversions happen as a direct result of police um, crackdowns on protesters and on free speech. So. You know, I, I can see that fueling the IWW, and that's um, something that has, for quite a long time, fueled radicalism in the United States. Yeah, well, it's fascinating. I mean, and and William Z. Foster, you know, in these years, he very much was an anarchist. Um, he ended up in New York City, uh, and he married a woman named Esther Abramowitz, um, and she was apparently living in a free love anarchist commune at the time. Um, and that's where he met her, um, you know, and then there was a famous anarchist pamphleteer at the time by the name of Jay Fox. And apparently Jay Fox was good friends with William Z. Foster as well. Um, and, you know, he was a figure in the IWW. But you have to remember the IWW, um, it was a radical anarcho-syndicalist labor union. The main labor federation in the United States was the American Federation of Labor, the AFL. And there started to be a question of, of what about all the workers that are in the American Federation of Labor? Now, the American Federation of Labor was very conservative. It was whites only. It was, you know, very, very, you know, right wing. And it had a ban on communists and radicals being members. And it was, you know, it was, it was considered to be not good. Uh, but the IWW, on the other hand, the IWW wouldn't sign any contracts, uh, you know, because they said that if you sign a union contract, that's recognizing your boss has the right to exploit you. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, and, and the IWW was very much, it was for the overthrow of capitalism. It was considered very radical. Um, and so there became an argument within the IWW about should they try to go and infiltrate the AFL or should they instead, uh, you know, just try to build the IWW. And William Z. Foster and a, a lot of people he was close to, he had quite a few followers. They took the position that the IWW should, you know, members of the IWW should go into the American Federation of Labor and try to take it over from within. And he, they actually called this theory boring from within, right? You know, like, mm -hmm. boring, like you bore with a, you know, it sounds like boring, you know, <laughs> we're going to bore from within. And that was his theory. Um, and so he and a number of, of IWW members quit and they formed an organization called the Syndicalist League of North America, the SLNA. Um, and William Z. Foster was the leader of the Syndicalist League of North America. Um, and they actually published a manifesto about what they believe written by William Z. Foster. And it's a fascinating manifesto because it's like it's got like a blueprint for the anarchist utopia of the United States in it. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> and, and it's fascinating. Chicago will be the capital of the anarchist United States uh, because Chicago is a working class city uh, and Washington, D.C. is associated with slavery and, and the southern plantation system. And so Chicago will be the capital. Um, and it also has some very interesting uh, rules for members. Uh, one of the rules is that uh, members of the Syndicalist League of North, of North America can't have children. Uh, because having children uh, leads to increasing the population and thus increasing competition for jobs and leading to poverty. Um, and plus, being a parent distracts from the revolution. However, after the revolution, it will be the duty of revolutionaries to populate the populate, you know, the, the earth as much as possible to increase the labor supply and the general surplus that the working class will enjoy, uh, which I think is fascinating. Uh, that's yeah. the rules uh, that, that, that they had for the Syndicalist League of North America. Also, the Syndicalist League of North America opposes, you know, opposes all capitalist wars. You know, you know, never will the workers go and die for the bosses. They don't vote because voting is reformism and politics is just a waste. It's all about the direct action on the job, right? The worker versus the employer. 
politicians, voting, laws. It's just a big waste of time. It's all about the direct you know, class struggle on the job. And the goal is eventually to have the great general strike. That's like the, you know, the, the, the Armageddon in anarcho-syndicalism is one day there will just be a great general strike where all the workers will go on strike and the bosses will be brought down in one fell swoop and the workers will, will own their factories. Um, and that was kind of the, the ideology of the Syndicalist League of North America. Um, and what's interesting is despite the fact that they were like an, an anarchist organization, it's a rather authoritarian vision, right? I mean, it's yeah, like, I was just thinking that it's a little bit interesting. It's like, it's, you know, the idea is, you know, no politics and all that, but there is kind of a, an odd authoritarian bent, even in this kind of anarchist manifesto that he wrote. Uh, do you want to react to that? Yeah, no, I definitely do. Um, you know, the stuff about not ha uh, assessing control over like kids and reproduction, that is, that strikes me as very culty, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, we, we've seen there's a number of um, organizations. If, if people look into um, like the syndicalists, it, like you see this in normal cults too, but like in there's a lot of radical organizations that are also cults. Like if you look into um, the co-op wars that happened, I believe in was, was it Wisconsin? Uh, we talked about it, but like the guy who ran uh, the uh, whole, because as it turned out that these various co-ops eventually grew into a cult where they were run by like a secretive leader who would even pick people out and tell them when it was time to have kids and who they should have kids with and who they should marry. And then of course, you know, uh, spoiler for, for those, the, the guy turned out to be a CIA operative. Um, yeah. So like the, and I don't know if that was part of his CIA work or if he was just a nut went crazy with power, but I'm always very skeptical of any organization that um, tries to extract, that tries to um, exude undue control over very fundamental aspects of somebody else's life, be it children, procreation, marriage, food that, that you can or cannot eat. Because a lot of the times I find that these are, are control mechanisms that people are putting in, in, into place. Um, I don't know if this was enforced or not. I, I do know that Foster did. He never reproduced uh but his wife had like a number of kids from a previous marriage so mm -hmm. he did have children but he they were not kids they were not he didn't yeah he yeah. didn't feel the need to well also especially if you're a radical like you know part of being a radical is recognizing that there's something very wrong and very out of step with the world that is almost insurmountable and beyond your individual level and ability to fix. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you know, I, I've got a kid now and I love him and I'm very glad that, you know, um, I, I had him, but you know, beforehand it was, you know, can I really bring a child into this world with everything as messed up as it is? So I'm not surprised right. at all, particularly since, you know, this was the early 1900s and, that's real. Like United States society was very, very brutal back then. So think of the economic argument though, you shouldn't have kids because it drives wages down because it increases job mm -hmm. competition. But after the revolution, it'll be your duty to procreate as much as possible. I just, I find that to be very, very like classically Marxist and economic. <laughs> You know, yeah. Like I can't have this kid because it'll you know make everyone <laughs> go down by like point zero zero one cent, and you know, uh, <laughs> you know. but then and, after the revolution we're going to have an orgy because that'll be our duty to the. You know, I mean. Well, everybody wants to have an orgy after the revolution or before the revolution or next Wednesday, um, but right. the what's also kind of interesting about that is so. The uh, idea that we should suppress these basic human d drives um, and sort of, I guess, sacrifice ourselves on the altar of revolution is something that I am actually very skeptical of. Um, sort of the Emma Goldman, if I can't dance, it's not my revolution is kind of my, my feeling on that. And I can see where the thinking might come from that this might depress wages because we're increasing the population. That sounds kind of Malthusian. Um, and, and I can also see like, so, so I understand what they're kind of getting at with that, but also I think it falls into a misunderstanding of how revolutions happen. People seem to think that revolutions happen because things are very bad and they just get very, very bad. And then finally, um, you know, there's the straw that breaks the camel's back and we have the revolution. 
But historically, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, whatever, none of these revolutions have been touched off by things being bad and then going from bad to worse. They have always been uh, as a result of a period where things are bad, then things get better for a short period, and then there is a sudden sharp economic downturn, um, it, whether it was in France or Russia or wherever. It, people have to have that taste of something better before it gets dashed. And if they don't, their spirit just breaks completely. So, and this is one of the reasons why I say never go full accelerationist um, because you, uh, you can't beat, if a population is just beaten down, they just go, well, I guess this is the best I can do. And they deal with it. Um, they have to have that hope and to have that hope, they must've experienced something good in their lives yeah. or at least historically. And, you know, William Z. Foster throughout his life, I mean, we're about to get into a series of compromises that he made. Right. I mean, and, and actually we're getting to, you know, you know, being a revolutionary, being an activist often involves a lot of compromises. And mm -hmm. um, that's about what I'm about to get to is because, you know, what the big event that happened that was kind of a defin definitive moment that destroyed the Wobblies, destroyed the Socialist Party was World War One. Right. Mm -hmm. And shortly before World War One, you know, Foster had broken away from the IWW and formed his Sindhuist League of North America. And they had set up shop in Chicago and they had all been hired by the Chicago Labor Federation, the local AFL of Chicago. And World War One broke out. Um, and, you know, at that point, if you were going to protest World War One, if you were going to be against World War One, you went to prison. Right. Eugene Debs gave an anti-war speech. He went to prison. Right. Um, and. You know, and what was he got nearly a million votes, I think, when he was when he ran for president from prison. Yeah. And and, you know, I mean, it was it, socialists and revolutionaries were going to prison left and right. Um, and the Syndicalist League of North America made a strategic decision. They said, OK, we have already infiltrated the Chicago Federation of Labor. We have a lot of power here. So what are we going to do? Are we going to protest World War One or not? And they made the decision not to. Right. And they they pretended to support World War One, basically. Um, and they changed their name from the Syndicalist League of North America to the International Trade Union Educational League. Um, mm -hmm. and that's a name that wouldn't sound as subversive. Trade yeah. union education, right? They were educating the trade unions to be revolutionaries, but that's they didn't say that. You know, that was that was yeah. just applied. And during World War One, you know, there was a huge demand for meat, right? Meat was essential. Um, and uh, the meat packing houses of Chicago were notorious for their horrendous horrendous conditions, right? I mean, the yeah. job by Upton Sinclair was awful. So William Z. Foster unionized the meat packing houses of Chicago. Um, and the way they did it was there was a war and there was, it would have been illegal to have a strike, but they never said they weren't going to go on strike. They knew they couldn't really go on strike, but they hinted that they might go on strike. And so the, there was kind of a hint in the air that there might be a strike. And then they, they, they used the union money to have these public hearings to just have people get up and testify about the horrendous conditions in the meatpacking facilities and how what it was like and how the conditions were awful and you know child labor and they just had these public hearings where the media the press uh you know and the public could come and just hear about this and they just humiliated the, the meatpacking bosses um you know and finally um woodrow wilson uh was the president they didn't want there to be any labor disputes at the time the bosses didn't want to be humiliated anymore so they unionized the meatpacking houses of Chicago and they formed the Stockyards Labor Council, it was called. And so all the meatpackers of Chicago got organized into a union uh, because of, of William Z. Foster and his effort. And that was that was pretty big. And yeah, it's huge. It was a huge, huge victory. And when you read William Z. Foster's life, the thing that really comes across is that we don't realize how difficult it was to just have industrial unions in this country. I mean, the huge sacrifices these people made in order to just get basic representation on the job for people doing industrial jobs. I mean, it was was it was very difficult. So then as World War One was coming to an end, uh, William Z. Foster, uh, he you know decided that he was going to try to unionize the steel industry of the United States. So in, in 1919, William Z. Foster led the great steel strike of 1919 and with with support of the American Federation of Labor. 365,000 steel workers went on strike and stopped going to work and demanded a union contract. And it went on for quite some time. Um, and it was a bloodbath. And a lot of people died. Um, the Ku Klux Klan attacked the strikers. Um, the other thing is that I mentioned the American Federation of Labor was racist. So when the strike happened, they used African-Americans as scab labor to replace 
uh, to replace the, um, you know, the workers. And William Z. Foster saw that and realized at that point how much the racism of the AFL hurt the labor movement, right? Because uh, a, a lot of black workers just hated the labor unions. They thought unions were racist. They saw unions as people who kept them from working. Um, and so, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, because at the time that was very true for them. Yeah, right. And uh, it was this, it was, and it was a pitched battle in Pittsburgh and in Gary, Indiana and in Cleveland in Chicago, all across the country. It was like a pitched battle. Um, and you know, there would be, you know, fighting on the picket lines and actually Woodrow Wilson called William Z. Foster to the white house and asked him to call off the strike. Um, and William Z. Foster, you know, I mean, he's the president of the United States asks William Z. Foster to call off the strike. And William Z. Foster actually would tell the story of how Woodrow Wilson, uh, assumed that because William Z. Foster was a leader of a union, he must be ignorant. He must be like a, an ignorant fool. So even though Woodrow Wilson was the president of the United States, he started talking to him in like hillbilly, like roughneck talk, you know, like, like trying to like understand. <laughs> and he, he told that story many years. It was like the funniest thing that he's meeting the president and he's trying to like talk to him in like, you know, roughneck working class talk that he can possibly understand. Um, there was a congressional investigation of the. I, uh, sorry. I, I just, I'd like to have been a, a fly on the wall for that because like freaking, uh, you know, Wood, Woodrow Wilson, he was a Harvard professor <laughs> and he's sitting there like, Oh, Oh, that, that would be hilarious. Just, yeah. I, I don't even know what he would have said, you know, but it would have just been, you know, I mean, it's, you know, F Foster would, apparently liked to do an impression of Woodrow Wilson's uh, roughneck talk. Uh, you know, it, it would get a good laugh. It was one of his favorite anecdotes. Um, but there was also a congressional investigation of, of the strike, you know, and he was called before Congress because they were investigating the strike. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan was putting up leaflets everywhere saying it, the, the strike was a communist conspiracy um, and all of this. So he was called before Congress and they had his syndicalism pamphlet. Uh, before Congress, and they read sections of it, you know, advocating the violent overthrow of the government and such. And they said, "Mr. Foster, do you do you agree with this?" And he laughed and he said, "You know, I was young, I was foolish back then, but I've grown up. I'm a patriotic American. I support World War One." And he just kind of laughed it off, uh, which is kind of amusing because yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> if you look at his life later, it was pretty clear he was lying through his teeth because he hadn't grown out of his radical ways at all, but he knew what he had to say in order to get the job done, so to speak. Um, and uh, the strike- I, I like that real politic aspect of him. There's rare, the, you don't see that a lot in radicals just in general, particularly leftist radicals, because a lot of us, um, you know, don't, we like letting people know that we're radical. It was one of the things like when I first started arguing with ANCAPs, ANCAPs would, do their best to try to play the optics game and not, re and th they would still say they're anarcho capitalists and, you know, um, talk, you know, in their lingo. So it wasn't a very good hiding game that they tried to play, but you know, they would say stuff like, Oh, we're not radical at all. We're just against violence. Are you against violence? Usually then you're an ANCAP. And, you know, whereas the, you know, the anarchists and the Marxists, we kind of like to lead with, no, we're very radical and you should be too. Here's why. Um, and that can be good. That's important. The, the door in the face sales technique is just as effective, if not more effective than the foot in the door technique. But like, Rarely do you see, um, I, I guess, radical politicians with that level of uh, understanding for what is going to play and what is not for, for uh, their ability to actually plan, carry out and execute these goals. So th that's it's honestly inspiring. Yeah, well, um, I mean, the steel strike of 1919, 1919 failed ultimately and it was lost. Um, but you know, I mean, that was a, a big moment because Williams D. Foster was known as the guy leading the steel workers strike who had this dangerous past as an anarchist and, and all of this. Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. the strike failed. You, you say dangerous. I say badass. <laughs> yeah, um, so, uh, but what was interesting was the communist party of the United States. So there had been the Russian revolution of 1917. It happened. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there were two, you know, there were two groups at that point calling themselves the Communist Party of the United States. It was the Communist Labor Party and the Communist Party. The Communist Labor Party was English speaking and the Communist, uh, you know, the Communist Party was non-English speakers. They eventually all merged into one party. Uh, but at that point, uh, there, there was, a, you know, there were communists and, you know, Bolsheviks in the United States who identified with the Soviet Union. But they did not support the steel strike because it was an AFL strike, right? The communists. Mm -hmm 
Bolshevik, you know, forces. They were the ones that that supported only the IWW. Um, so um, what was what was weird is that you know that William Z. Foster uh, had kind of a negative view of the communists uh, because he said, "Look, and and you know, I'm trying to lead this strike here, and there's this radical group that's supposed to be for the working class. They don't support my strike." Um, what was amusing was that in Gary, Indiana. Um, uh, the Communist Party uh, had put up posters all over all over the city, uh, denouncing William Z. Foster, calling him Easy Foster uh, because he was like a moderate, like you know he was easy or whatever. Um, and also then telling the workers the only way they could win the strike was if they took up arms and violently overthrew the government. Um, oh boy! <laughs> you know he's, uh, these communists are a bunch of wackos or whatever. So, mm -hmm. but he's lost the steel strike. Um, you know he's he's working. He goes back to work as a railroad worker. He's you know he's working on the railroads. Um, but Lenin in Moscow decides to have an international convention of trade unionists uh, in the Soviet Union. So William Z. Foster, as the leader of the of the steel workers strike, is invited to this conference. So he goes to the Soviet Union and he meets with Lenin personally. And Lenin explains to him that he had been urging the American communists to support the strike and that this theory of boring from within was something that the Bolsheviks had had been pushing for a long time. The idea that you should go where the workers are. Right. And if, if the workers are in a, a non-revolutionary union, join that union and win them to communism. And so William Z. Foster was kind of blown away by that. He's like, oh, OK, Lenin agreed with me. Um, and that was pretty exciting. So he ended up uh, after he came back to the United States. They had the unity convention of the Communist Party USA in 1921, um, and all these groups that were trying to get the communist franchise, they merged into one in Michigan, mm -hmm. and they, 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 we had the Communist Party come into existence. And, and this is CPUSA, the, which yeah. we have now. And, yeah, and so William Z. Foster, I guess you could say he was a founding member, but he wasn't exactly a founding member. He was, he was a, a member of the eventual merger that became what is the Communist Party, right? Um, and uh, he continued to lead the Trade Union Educational League, which was considered to be the, the labor wing of the Communist Party. Um, and what's interesting is like at the American Federation of Labor Convention, uh, he, he attended as the leader of the Communist Party's labor work. And, uh, you know, from the podium, the president of the AFL uh, pointed to him during his speech and he said, I want everyone here to know one man who the labor movement wants nothing to do with, William Z. Foster. And he points to him like in the balcony right there. This man is a communist. He's a traitor in all this. We, you know, and he was kind of the symbol of the radical side of the labor movement, um, which is fascinating. Um, and he led the Communist Party in uh, trying to work within the unions to push for more radical politics. Um, in uh, in the Kentucky and uh, West Virginia, they had a campaign to save the miners' union, uh, going mm -hmm. around trying to push more radical politics inside of the miners' union. Um, in New York City, there was organizing among the garment workers, um, and they were trying to organize the garment workers. There were garment workers' strikes um, and, and all over the country, William Z. Foster was speaking, uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flint, uh, she did not join the communist party until much later, but she had worked with Foster in the IWW and she was somebody who worked with the trade union educational league. And William Z. Foster was one of the most prominent leaders of the communist party. Um, but in the 1920s, just after the communist party had been formed, it was very, very factional. Um, and there were two major factions. What, the, the left was factional. Caleb, what? <laughs> And there were, there were two factions. One was led by William C. Foster, and the other was led by a guy named Jay Lovestone. And they, no one knew what they disagreed about. It was almost like some weird nepotism thing. It was like somebody's working for somebody. And that, like, there's letters. William C. Foster received a letter from California where a woman said, you know, Mr. Foster, and it was a friend of his, said to him, you know, you should know there's horrific things being done in your name in this state. And that no one really knew what the fight in the communist party was about. They just knew that William Z. Foster and, um, and Jay Lovestone, they led these two factions and they hated each other and they were constantly battling with each other. Um, and that was the 1920s. Um, and so they had these gatherings in Moscow, the communist international and Stalin sat down William Z. Foster and, uh, and, uh, Jay Lovestone. Um, and he, he gave his famous speech to the American communists by Stalin. And one of the things that angered Stalin the most was that both William Z. Foster and Jay Lovestone had both been telling people that their faction was the Stalinist faction, you know, and that um, because, you know, Lenin had died and Stalin yeah. was the new leader. And so they were both whispering, you know, we're the Stalinist faction. We're in with Stalin, the new leader in the Soviet Union. And they'd both been calling themselves Stalinists. And so Stalin 
was yelling at them and said, there's no such thing as a Stalinist. He said, I'm a Marxist Leninist. Communism is Marxism Leninism. Can you cut that out? I don't endorse either of your factions. Can you just get along? <laughs> yeah, right? it's rather, rather amusing. Um, yeah. yeah. What do you think of all that? Well, I mean, the the first thing that I'm, it, it's interesting for a number of reasons. So first you mentioned that, and this is jumping back a little ways, but I wanted to make sure to remark on this, um, that the, how damaging racism was to the struggle of the working class. And this is something that's like from the inception of America, racism has been like one of the worst things uh, for, you know, obviously for the people that primarily suffer from it, but also for the workers. And if you go reread Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States, one of the, I think one of the first chapters drawing a color line, the codified ideas about ra race and racism um, were like essentially brought into American politics after there were like joint white and black indentured servitude revolts and uh, um, runaways. And then that was when they started to punish race mixing and give uh, some benefits to the uh, white indentured servitude uh, servants and uh, treat the black indentured servants even worse. Um, you know, so you can see that it's used to control people again and to keep people divided and to keep people fighting. Um, I'm also not surprised that um, William Z. Foster and this other guy um, are both running communist factions and hate each other and nobody can figure out why. Um, <laughs> this is, you know, um, the personal is political and, you know, we, we see this in, I mean, you even go back to like the IWA when there was the famous fight between Marx and Proudhon mm -hmm. and like that led to the eventual, um, you know, black red divide where the, the Marxists and the anarchists split at like the third international, I believe it was. And like the, the inception, say what? It was the first international. The first international. I'm sorry. But it was like the third meeting of it or something. Yeah, yeah. If, I, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, but like the um, that fight between Marx and Proudhon, because they had started out as friends, was over book publishing rights. Like <laughs> Marx or Proudhon, I forget what it was. I think it was Marx had a bad run in with a publisher that Proudhon refused to stop working with. Mm. And they were just like, no, I'm done with you. And then suddenly they're starting writing essays, uh, attacking each other. <laughs> and, you know, there's it's so interesting that when you see people, radicals get together and try to do these really big things to change the world, they are still people. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they have the, the kind of small, um, sometimes petty um, jealousies and drives that all people do. So I, I think that's an inherently human thing. Um, and I think it's it's funny, and I, I love that they were both calling each other Stalinists. This, you know, uh, being when that was a popular thing to call yourself, and then you have actual Stalin come in and knock their heads together. That's right. hilarious. <laughs> well, on the note of what you just said, you know, um, the polemical tradition of Marxism, where it's like, you know, it makes Marx very difficult to read. Um, mm -hmm. One of the the funniest things I find about the Marx Proudhon disagreement is that uh, you know Proudhon, his big book was called The Philosophy of Poverty. Mm -hmm. So Karl Marx to like own him as publish publishes his book, <laughs> The Poverty of Philosophy, you know, you know, and it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's like, oh, got you, you know, and that's like considered, you know, the poverty of philosophy is is one of like Marx's most key works. But like a lot of Marx's works, it's very difficult because it's not written in the form of here are my ideas. It's written in the form of here's this other asshole who's got these ideas that are completely <laughs> wrong. And here's a quote from him, and this is wrong. And here's a and 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 you read it and you're like, who's Proudhon? What? I, yeah, what's yeah. happening here? <laughs> right, right. And that makes it very difficult. And a, a lot of Marx's books are written that way. They're polemics with people that are long dead, and and it, you don't mm -hmm. understand the context, and that makes it very difficult to read. Um, yeah, that, that's that's like a, a leftist. Uh, like you pick up like a you you know you meet one of those people selling a paper at a protest, and you buy the paper and the protest, and it's people you don't know denouncing other people you don't know. <laughs> right, you know. Oh boy. So, um, so you know, it, it's it, it's interesting to see how much things change, how much they stay the same. Right, right. The people's front of Judea, right? Um, yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, so anyhow, though, um, you know, 1928 is a kind of a pivotal moment in the history of American com or of global communism. Right. Because that's when um, that's when Stalin like basically triumphs in his leadership of, of the Soviet Communist Party. He had first defeated the Trotskyites 
in 1924, mm -hmm. and then in 1928, he defeated Bukharin and the Bukharinite, what they call the right opposition. And so Stalin and his program of what he called socialism in one country uh, became the dominant view in the Communist International. And the Communist International announced that this, you know, the, the world, since the Russian Revolution had gone through, uh, it was entering the third period. The first period had been the revolutions at the end of World War I. You know, that was where the Russian Revolution came from. That was the, the revolutionary period. And then in the 1920s, you had the, the period of capitalist stabilization. And then in 1928, they said, we're entering now a third period, which is a period of capitalist economic crisis, because already the Great Depression was was on the brink of occurring in 1928. Gee, well, I wonder what capitalist economic crisis is like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in 1928, they announced the third period. And Stalin and, and the Communist International decide that in the third period, the main danger is social democrats, right? Social Democrats are, are the roadblock to revolution. Um, and so um, it's going to be necessary for the communists around the world to just do everything they can to push back against social democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and th this is where the, the social fascist uh, slam yeah, came yeah, from. The term social fascist was a term they started using. Um, so uh, the Communist International reaches this conclusion, and the Communist Party of the United States is expected to follow through with it. But Jay Lovestone doesn't agree with it. Jay Lovestone says, well, that's true for the rest of the world, but it doesn't apply to the United States. So Stalin accuses Jay Lovestone of American exceptionalism. Oh, I thought he was going to accuse him of being not dialectical. No, American <laughs> exceptionalism. And that's actually where the term American exceptionalism comes from. Stalin. Because he was saying the Americans are the exception. Right, that the America is, ex is the exception to Marxist you know, dialectics and such. So Jay mm -hmm. Lovestone and his followers are kicked out of the Communist Party for American exceptionalism. They're called the exceptionalists, and they're kicked out, right? And so yeah. William Z. Foster becomes the leader of, of the Communist Party, and his faction are basically in charge because Jay Lovestone gets kicked out. Funny story is Jay Lovestone ended up running the trade union work of the CIA. Um, that's actually, in the 1950s, the CIA hired him to run the CIA-controlled labor unions. Um, and. Mm -hmm. And so he ended up being a CIA operative, which is kind of a crazy now, story. Yeah. Now, I wasn't aware there were CIA-controlled um, unions in the United States. I, I know about yellow unions. Yeah. Are controlled Internationally. Uh, the, the CIA set up something called the Free Trade Union Federation uh, during the mm -hmm. Cold War, and it was unions that banned communists. Um, and yeah. United Auto Workers had something called Solidarity House. Um, that, that would help coordinate these unions. And I think they're still around. I think it's still around, but it's unions that are explicitly anti-communist uh, that get kind of subsidized by the U.S. State Department and the CIA. And Jay Lovestone uh, ended up being the guy who ran it. And probably his most successful operation was Solidarznak in Poland. Um, and during the, the Polish uh, Solidarznak events, Jay Lovestone actually had an office in Ronald Reagan's White House. Uh, kind of amazingly. So that's what happened with Jay Lovestone. He ended up becoming uh, becoming quite quite right wing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a wild story. Um, but uh, well, th that happens a lot. Uh, I, I think um, on the left too, with certain people. Um, I think they call it the God that failed. Um, like uh, the most famous example of it, I can think of off the top of my head is like Thomas Sowell, who he was a he was a Black Panther. And, um, you know, he switched because there are certain people on the left who maybe get involved with the left because they think there's about to be a revolution of some kind and they want to be in the right position to get a prominent position post revolution. And when they real, when the revolution doesn't happen and they lose faith in it happening or happening and being successful, they will sometimes uh, make the jump to the extreme right. And you, you saw that with Thomas Sowell, you see it with a number of um, figures. And, you know, even to today, you've got Thomas Sowell who make arguments like, Oh, what's your fair share of what some of, of what someone else worked for is an argument against taxation when that's clearly a socialist argument about uh, surplus uh, value. So yeah, what it really was with Jay Lovestone at the end of the day was that Jay Lovestone was a labor bureaucrat, right? And mm -hmm. that he, he had made real inroads into the American Federation of Labor and the miners unions, and that his faction had a lot of influence in the labor movement. And, you know, following Stalin's line of we're now going to fight the social Democrats like crazy, would have cost him a lot of money, basically yeah. lost a lot of jobs. And, and, you know, the communist party did go into kind of a sectarian frenzy after 1928. Um, and 
Jay Lovestone just wasn't going to do that, right? Because he had invested so much and, you know, it was just, he, he wasn't going to do that. So he was a labor activist and, you know, Stalin wanted one thing and he wanted another thing. Uh, interesting. Now, I, I had a quick question though, sure, really yeah. quickly. So the, the social, de uh, the social Democrats. Yeah. Um, now is this comparable to, you know, how you see the left oftentimes, uh, especially the more radical ends of the left seem more, annoyed with the Democrats than the Republicans to the point where, you know, you will occasionally get some uh, leftists who said, well, it's better that Trump wins or something like that. I mean, is, is it that attitude taken to an extreme or is there actually some reason why, because I, from what I've seen a lot of the time with the, the social fascists slam, mm -hmm. um, it didn't seem to be particularly effective. And aside from a few instances, it doesn't seem to be accurate. So, so both ways. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I think is the untold story of it is that the American Federation of Labor banned any member of the Communist Party from being a member. The Socialist mm -hmm. Party had a slogan. They said, our main enemy is to our left, referring to the Communist Party. Um, they started saying that the reason socialism was losing popularity was because of the evil Soviet Union and because of anarchists. And, and so it went both ways, right? Um, you know, so and it's kind of like when they squeezed out Bernie Sanders, essentially, yeah. is what you're talking about, where you've got Chris Wallace losing. He's thinking there's going to be, uh, you know, a French Revolution style executions in Central Park. And then the Democrats come down and, you know, spend yeah. more of their time attacking the le their, the le their own left and trying to reach out to their right. Um, and the other thing was the race question because communists were thoroughly anti-racist. And one of the, one of the things that Jay Lovestone raised uh, actually in opposition to William Z. Foster was that William Z. Foster was always pushing for anti-racist policies in the labor movement, right? Uh, he felt like that hurt. He said in the labor movement, if you just focus on the union, don't bring politics into it. Right. And so, and the communist party was the party of black freedom. I mean, the, mm -hmm. The African Blood Brotherhood uh, was affiliated with it. That was an armed group that fought the Klan and trained black people in how to defend themselves. Uh, the Communist Party took the position that black people were a, a nation within U.S. borders uh, that was a colonized nation and had the right to self-determination. Um, and, you know, they were an anti-racist organization. Down with Jim Crow segregation was their slogan. Um, so, you know, they were they were known to to, you know, to take positions on the race question, which at the time was completely taboo and the socialist party would not do at the time. Um, so that, that was an aspect of it, but part it's, of it's interesting to see that essentially like you, you're having arguments, but it seems like it's been flipped that now, um, you know, the, the less radical sections of the left are very interested in sort of the identity politics portion and the more radical sections tend to be more interested in class and they both hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and that, you know, after they took this position, right, the Communist Party ended up forming its own labor federation. And their attitude was, we're going to go organize workers that are not in unions. And one of the main things they did was go to the South and organize sharecroppers, both white and black, uh, into unions. In Gastonia, North Carolina, uh, there was a big strike led by the Communist Party. Um, you know, all across the South and, you know, in Georgia and Alabama, the Communist Party recruited a lot of people and was an interracial organization. And that was really dynamic. And that was during, during you know, these, these early years of the 1930s. Um, but when you talk about the sectarianism, um, I actually, um, I, I did learn, uh, you know, in New York City, right, the Garment Workers Union was controlled by the Socialist Party. Um, and the, you know, the Communist Party formed their own Garment Workers Union. Um, and uh, they actually had this silly rhyme to attack the cloak makers union. Uh, it was like it was like a song that they sang uh, that followed their like sectarian line. So I'll just uh, I'll just sing it to you very quickly. Let's the, hear it. The cloak makers union is a no good union. It's a company union by the bosses. Those right wing cloak makers are just socialist fakers who play upon the workers double crosses. The hill quits Dubinsky's and the Thomas's. They make to the workers false promises. They preach socialism while they practice fascism to preserve capitalism for the bosses. That sounds like a that sounds like a standard like leftist jingle. One, you know, slaps. Thank you. <laughs> but um, also, it's that thing where, that they do where they're using the rhyme and they're um, like so that it can be memorable and that they can, you know, use it to, uh, 
you could probably yell it out at a rally or whatever, or individual people can remember it more easily, but also because they're leftists and they're a little overly academic. <laughs> they're like, they're putting in words that don't quite fit the rhyme scheme and are just a little bit too long, uh, which I think is one of the hallmarks of uh, those kinds of uh, chants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it was, they were, they were fighting the Socialist Party, but 1929, you have the Great Depression breaks out, and the Communist Party immediately starts building these things called unemployment councils, which go and fight for the rights of unemployed people. And, you know, when a family gets evicted from their home, uh, the unemployment council comes and breaks the locks and puts all their stuff back in. Um, and they, they fight off the bailiffs. Um, they, they organize the Bonus Army. Uh, which is un uh, veterans um, and thousands of veterans uh, march on Washington, D.C. to demand the payment of veterans' benefits and their veterans' bonuses. Look, <clears throat> makes me so damn mad a whole lot of people speak of you as tramps. By God, they didn't speak of you as tramps in 1917 and 18. No. <laughs> Take it from me. This is the greatest demonstration of Americanism we've ever had. Pure Americanism. War, the greatest concentration of fighting troops in Washington since 1865. And the roaring flames sound the death knell to the fantastic bonus army that ends so disastrously in the shadow of the capital of the United States of America. And actually, uh, March 6th, 1931 is International Unemployment Day. Um, and International Unemployment Day in every like major country in Europe and in the United States, there's huge rallies for the rights of the unemployed. And in New York City, uh, you know, something like 20,000 people gather in Union Square for the rights of the unemployed. And William Z. Foster is the leader of the of the rally. Um, and the New York City Police Department, you know, says you don't have a permit, you cannot march. And so William Z. Foster uh, gets up in front of the crowd and says, you know, they have opened this street for every king. And every monarch who ever visits this city, they give a parade to. And, you know, the working class, we're going to march. And so they march and they charge into the police. Uh, and uh, the Young Communist League uh, has a bunch of marbles. So they, they roll them and the police on horseback all, you know, fall over. Um, and they, they charge from Union Square down to City Hall. And it's an epic battle uh, that, that, you know, goes on for hours between the communists and the police. Um, and, uh, you know, William Z. Foster uh, is there, uh, you know, giving the closing speech of the rally and he's arrested uh, for inciting a riot. Um, and he, go he does like about a year in prison uh, on Rikers Island for, for that demonstration where he basically ordered the crowd to go have their march, even though the police told them not to. And it resulted in utter chaos throughout the city. Um, and it's interesting because that 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 route right from like City Hall area to Union Square I think you and I have walked that route uh, many times ourselves um, mm -hmm. and police uh, many times uh, on that route uh, as well. So, you know, I think that's kind of interesting that people were walking, uh, wa walking those very streets uh, many decades before we were. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that, that is a popular route. And we've definitely walked that a number of times. I actually used to work uh, near Union Square and I would hear marches go back, go past my window like all the time. It was usually because they were marching from Union Square up to the U.N., um, in the other direction, but yeah, we've walked that number of times. I've I've been inside Rikers, you know, when I went to uh, uh, interview Cecily uh, while she was in there. <sighs> Rikers is Rikers is tough. It's one it, it, one of the most depressing places to be because you wouldn't expect it to like when you think of like Rikers Island Penitentiary, you think something like very like almost like out of Batman or something. But really, it's like a really depressed elementary school. Like think of an elementary school that's really run down, um, but with like razor wire around it and, you know, uh, metal sliding grates and stuff. And every, everyone in there hates being in there. The guards, the people, I, I got out of there and I'm one of the more empathetic people. So after leaving, I was just like, oh man, I, I got to get like 10 drinks. <laughs> well, interesting in his memoir, pages from a worker's life, uh, he talks about being in Rikers Island and, it's interesting because at that point, you know, homosexuality was not something people talked about. Um, and, uh, you know, he doesn't say anything that's explicitly in favor of LGBT rights, but he comes pretty close. Um, he refers to homosexuality as, quote, prison vice, which apparently was like 1930s. That's what people mm -hmm. call it. You know, it was assumed people might 
You're going into the prison vice, kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of rape would go on. And they, they talked about, like, the guards would, like, reward prisoners by putting a, 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 a trans person in their cell and things like that. Like, it was very, very vicious. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was it was very, very vicious. And he talked about how the conditions in the jail, you know, really showed how awful capitalism was. And his writings on uh, on what went on in Rikers Island is actually particularly good. But he got out of prison after about a year um, for mm -hmm. reading that. And then he ran for president um, and he ran for president on the Communist Party ticket. Um, and he toured the United States going from city to city, talking about why they needed a Soviet America. You know, and that was the campaign. And he even wrote a book towards Soviet America about what the United States would look like. And he called it the USSA, the United Soviet States of America. Now, was this before or after Trotsky made that speech, um, if America should go communist? That was an article Trotsky wrote for Fortune magazine. Um, and he wrote it around the same time. Around yeah. Yeah, in the 1930s, yeah. In the early if, if I recall, he was supposed to give that speech or something. He was supposed to give it as a speech at some point, but like uh, somebody stopped him or something. Oh, okay. I, 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 would, I have to go back and look into the history. Like, I know that it was supposed to be spoken at, at some point. Yeah, I just knew it as an article for Fortune magazine, but there you go. Uh, but but yeah, um, you know, and he toured the United States, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, giving a, a speech about, uh, you know, the need for a Soviet America and he would get arrested everywhere he spoke, everywhere he spoke, he would be like immediately arrested, um, you know, and detained and beaten up. And it was very, very overwhelming. Um, and he actually had a heart attack towards the end of his presidential campaign, just from the overwhelming stress of the whole thing. And he went to the Soviet Union, uh, to recover, um, and that he had a little bit of a psychotic and break that went along with that. He was just not well. Right. Because this I mean, and it the dedication that William Z. Foster had was just overwhelming. I mean, this guy would just work so, so hard. I mean, he was going everywhere. And, you know, the fact that his heart, you know, gave out finally and that he had kind of a, a you know, a breakdown almost from the stress of being in prison for a year and then going around the country and giving a speech. Um, you know, this this was a really, really dedicated man. Um, and he was a very, very charismatic man as well. I mean, he was described as a very, very good orator. He would speak to audiences for hours and make them laugh and make them cry. Um, and he was just, he was a really, really powerful orator. Um, and he, you know, he, you know, Charlie Chaplin had fundraisers for him at his, his Hollywood mansion. Um, and that, that presidential campaign in 1932, the communists got hundreds of thousands of votes. Um, and, uh, it was, it was a big, big campaign. And that book towards Soviet America that he wrote is still widely studied. Um, it's considered a lot of communists read that book now, even today. And it's, it's a very basic, very clearly written introduction to what the Communist Party stands for. It's very, very powerful. Um, uh, it's a little more authoritarian than some of the stuff they would have put out later. Um, he does have, there's a, there's a particular section in it where he says that, you know, under, the, uh, under the, the leadership of the American working class, there will only be one political party, the Communist Party. All other political parties will be liquidated. We will get rid of, and then he lists like every political party you ever heard of. And <laughs> we will also get rid of all the institutions that push bourgeois ideology, such as the YMCA, the Boy Scouts. And he starts listing like all every group you know you ever heard of, the Freemasons, the Elks, you know, <laughs> you know, and people love to quote that section and kind of make fun of it because it's like he's just listing every group they're going to outlaw. Uh, yeah. when the power and it's a little bit silly uh, but the book overwhelmingly is is pretty good um and uh but he he went to the soviet union to recover from a heart attack um and somebody that he had trained his mentor uh earl browder ended up or his mentee i should say earl browder ended up becoming the leader of the communist party while he was in you know in in not in exile but recovering from his his heart attack um, and Earl Browder, um, Earl Browder becomes the general secretary. He's the chairman and that's how the communist party works. There's two titles at the top. There's a chairman or a chairperson and a general secretary. Um, and it's not, you can always tell which one is in charge, but they're like, apparently like equal titles, but you know, um, you know, Foster was the chairman because he was away, but the general secretary Earl Browder was in charge when Foster was, was, was there, he was the chairman and he was in charge. So it's kind of weird how that works, but the communist party always has two leaders. One is a chair chair and one is the general secretary. I mean, it's kind of a weird aspect of the communist party and how it's set up. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. I mean, inter-party politics, I'm not surprised that he, um, uh, was listing off like all of the organizations that he was planning to ban. It seems like he's a guy who gets a lot of big ideas and um, can kind of 
get locked into the minutia of what he would imagine doing if he, if he gained, you know, this great power. Um, it seems to me to be, it is definitely silly. And it's kind of an outside in approach to politics and almost shows a, a somewhat, I guess, misunderstanding of how politics works and like why specific organizations are powerful and why others aren't. And like, because, you know, these, other organizations like be they the Elks Club or the, the Boy Scouts or whatever, you know, they exist within the system and have people dedicated to them because they provide something to them. Uh, you know, it's, it's not just the organization itself. And so the idea is, is like, OK, you know, we're going to outlaw this organization. You still have all those people. And it's the same thing of like if they go and outlaw like uh, the well they went and they outlawed a number of communist parties and the, you know they can William Z Foster continued to organize right. uh, he just did it under a different name so it, it seems like sometimes occasionally he gets stuck on on the details of what he's imagining could be um, as opposed to and it, that actually strikes me in a way. Very, I understand it from a leftist radical standpoint, but at least for me, that seems to be a very un-anarchist way of approaching things. Um, because oftentimes anarchists tend to have an idea of generally what we want and what we want to push for um, now and then like a, a larger goal. But a lot of the time we don't get hung up on the details because we expect them to get sorted out through the process of struggle. Um, in much the same way, like if you read David Graeber's Parable of the Divided Island, he talks about how um, the, the, the fight between, um, you know, right wing libertarians and traditional classical anarchists would most likely be settled out in practice with the elimination of the state. Um, so it, it seems like one of the big differences I find between an anarchist personality type and a Marxist personality type is a lot of the Marxist personality types, they tend to be very big on the planning and very detail oriented and very regimented and kind of buttoned down. And anarchists tend to be a little bit more free and more, okay, we're going to do this generally and see what happens. And I think there's merits and, and, and um, uh, pitfalls to both um ideologies but, to both approaches but i feel like the uh it's not surprising that william z foster became a marxist because he was doing that before he he was doing that kind of analysis and that kind of thinking before he was ever identifying as one right well that book towards soviet america i, I think you know it was published in 1931 um and or 1932 for the 32 presidential campaign and, you know, it's weird is if you look at the early years of the Great Depression in the United States, the country overall was in a weirdly authoritarian bent, right? So, you know, first of all, you know, there was an attempt, you know, Roosevelt came in. When, when Roosevelt came into office, he was presenting himself almost like he was going to be some kind of dictator or something. Like mm -hmm. the, he was going to fix the economy with the National Recovery Act. And they had this symbol for the National Recovery Act, which was the Blue Eagle. And like all the children in school would like pledge their loyalty to the Blue Eagle. You know, and they had like the Blue Eagle pledge and they had like films promoting the Blue Eagle. Um, and that was kind of like authoritarian. But then we also know that, you know, a year later there was the business plot and a plot by like actual fascists to overthrow Roosevelt. Um, yep. and that there was just like, I guess, you know, you know, when people are, I mean, people were literally starving to death all across the United States at this point. Right. I mean deaths of malnutrition were happening all the time. Dead bodies were on the cities of our streets. People were eating dandelions to survive. That was like a thing that went on and, and people were boiling dandelions because they had no food and, and there were refugees like, you know, piling into California and it was, you know, it, it, and this is around the time of the dust bowl, right? Cause a lot of crops got wiped out. Yeah. And that there was, you know, it was, it was a, a huge catastrophe and the country seemed to every political group was kind of putting forward some kind of authoritarian vision. I think I, you know, and it's weird because um, what I'm about to get to is that, 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 you know, well, after William Z. Foster comes back from the Soviet Union, you know, politics has changed quite a bit because Hitler has come to power in Germany. Mm -hmm. Fascism is on the rise. And so the communist party completely does like a, you know, a complete 180. Um, 
instead of, you know, the socialist party is our enemy, um, you know, now the kind of popular popular front, meaning that they are aligning with Roosevelt, they're aligning with the socialist party to build a united front against fascism. And um, so they do a complete, you know, a complete turnaround, right? Um, and, you know, they're sending brigades to Spain to fight, uh, uh, you know, against Franco. And, and you know, Earl Browder, who William Z. Foster trained, has kind of like become the like the new leader. And Earl Browder is seen as just completely watering down what the Communist Party is all about. You don't have to give long-winded explanations anymore. People see, the people understand. What they need is a voice to express it for them and an organization to rally them. And the people are going to march forward with the people will belong the victory. One thing is that, you know, the Communist Party has always maintained that black people are a nation and have the right to self-determination. Earl Browder, he decides, eh, that's a little bit too, and he kind of shuts that down. And while the Communist Party protests against racism in the North, he kind of, Earl Browder basically shuts down their anti-Jim Crow activism in the South, which is pretty awful. Um, And that, you know, you know, the Communist Party, they're part of the Roosevelt coalition. Um, And that, that while, you know, William Z. Foster had been building a group of like labor union activists, uh, many of the people that are coming into the Communist Party now are like wealthier kind of people. They're Hollywood actors, they're college professors, they're on Broadway, and that the Communist Party is kind of being dominated by like middle class, liberal, bohemian kind of folks, right? Um, yeah, I know those folks. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's kind of who's running the Communist Party. But William C. Foster is still, you know, he's still the chairman, um, and he still has this core of like very, very dedicated labor union activists who get a lot done. And, you know, mm-hmm. the sit down strike, they call it Labor's Gettysburg. Um, and that was a turning point. And then, you know, you have the rise of the CIO with the sit down strike wave and William Z. Foster, while, you know, his health was not allowing him to like be on the picket lines, all of, he was basically leading the, the communist party during all of this. And ultimately, you know, in the late thirties, 1939, the steel un- steel workers are unionized. Finally, what he set out to do is finally done by the CIO. Um, so, you know, I mean, you know, there still is this labor, this very, very dedicated labor core, but there is this very middle class element that's coming to dominate the Communist Party. Um, mm-hmm. And they, of course, love Earl Browder. Earl Browder is their guy. Um, and um, so then, you know, uh, World War II breaks out. And of course, the communists, you know, fascism is the main enemy. So they support World War II. Um, and Earl Browder, uh, you know, he very much supports World War II. And so the Earl Browder gets this great idea that the Communist Party is going to dissolve and it's going to change its name to the Communist Political Association. So in 1942, they have an emergency convention of the Communist Party in New York City and they dissolved the Communist Party. Now, William Z. Foster is opposed to dissolving the Communist Party. He thinks that's not a good idea. Uh, and they have a national committee meeting and he argues about it. But finally, they decide they're going to they're going to dissolve the party. So just to like stick it to William Z. Foster. Earl Browder makes William Z. Foster read the announcement that they're dissolving the party, just to, just to be nasty like that, you know. Yeah. And th- why, why, why does he want to d- dissolve the party exactly? The idea is that having a separate party might divide, you know, the country and and not help the war effort. And the Communist Party, it's bizarre. They start a petition campaign to cancel the elections, actually, uh, so that um, and to have the Republicans and Democrats nominate the same candidate to, you know, so because having an election will distract from the war effort. And the Communist Party, they, they really go pretty over the top in their support for World War II. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I think it was necessary to support, you know, the United States government in fighting fascism, but they took it to some rather extreme lengths. And part, one of those was dissolving the party, which William Z. Foster and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and a lot of the people are like, why are we doing this? And they, they become the Communist Political Association. And the Communist Political Association, instead of Marxist-Leninists, they're Marxist Jeffersonians, um, you know, uh, for one. Uh, and they, um, you know, they, they have some very, they're, they're, it's really just watering down everything the Communist Party is about, right? Um, but then World War II comes to an end, right? And yeah. uh, the leader of the French Communist Party, uh, Jacques Duclos, writes an article denouncing Earl Browder uh, for the French magazine. Uh, basically, French Communist magazine saying that, look, there's this guy who's in charge of the Communist Party of the United States, and he's not a communist. He's just a reformist liberal, right? And he calls out this this, this article by Jacques Duclos, calls out Earl Browder. Earl Browder was supporting U.S. imperialism in Latin America, 
um, you know, and saying that it was it was good for the United States to be overthrowing some of the governments there. Um, and and Earl Browder, you know, he said that the black people were not a nation. And Earl Browder, he even called for the wartime no strike pledge to continue after the war. And he argued that the United States and the Soviet Union would eventually merge into one country and they would adopt the best elements of both systems. And and so these ideas that Earl Browder has come out with are so ridiculous yeah. that, that Jacques Duclos, the leader of the French Communist Party, writes this article. Well, the Soviet Union really likes that article. And so they send translations of it to, you know, every communist party in the world. Mao also really likes the article. So Mao writes some articles denouncing Earl Browder. So they have another emergency convention of the Communist Party, and they expel Earl Browder. And William Z. Foster's members, they take over the leadership of the Communist Party. And the Communist Party is refounded at this emergency convention. And apparently Earl Browder was given like every opportunity. If he had just gotten up and said, like, I'm wrong or just gone along with the new position, uh, they would have, uh, you know, they would have let him stay in the party. But he was not going to back down. He had decided he was going to you know, he was going to, and apparently he'd been promised that after the war, he would be made into secretary of labor or something. So he was not going to, going to back down. So Earl Browder is kicked out and he eventually becomes the Soviet Union's book dealer, which is kind of hilarious, right? <laughs> There's something called Progress Publishers, which was like the Soviet book publishing company in the United States. And so Earl Browder ran the book publishing company for the Soviet embassy. And he was a registered foreign agent who sold the Soviet Union's books. Um, and that's what he did. Um, it, it's a rather bizarre story. William Z. Foster becomes the leader of the Communist Party um, right you know, as the Cold War is starting. He's now the leader again. Um, oh, boy. That, and, that'll be an interesting position yeah, to be in. <laughs> yeah, Winston Churchill gives his famous Iron Curtain speech. Um, so the next day, they have 20,000 people gather in you know, Union Square to march against the danger of a new war against the Soviet Union, right? And the mm -hmm. Communist Party coming out of World War II is still a massive organization. So uh, before we get into what comes next, why don't you react? Well, I'm not, so I'm not surprised that things got more authoritarian uh, during the Great Depression. And this is something that I, I think a lot of people don't realize is, is that uh, people's thought patterns tend to go more towards authoritarianism when they are under stress. Like when your anxiety raises, you're more likely to be thinking in more authoritarian than you otherwise would be. Um, so, you know, if they're in situations where they're dealing with starvation, with a lack of jobs, um, and, you know, maybe it's something that humans have, uh, have evolved to do. It's this idea to unify behind a, a strong uh, leader. And that can, you know, we can see how wrong that can go. But you can think when we're a band of, you know, a hundred or so humans trying to survive, I don't know, lions, we can see that might be a much more beneficial uh, instinct. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, I'm also, being that I know what happens to the left in the United States uh, during the Red Scare, I'm wondering if the dissolution of the party and all of this chaos essentially that's occurring um is part of the reason why they were able to destroy the american left in the way that they did um because again it's the like what i talked about with like outlawing the boy scouts and whatnot um yeah. you know there you you can get rid of an organization legally but you can't get rid of the people that are interested in that organization but if the organization itself loses the ability to maintain and, and to, to provide those people with the thing that they are getting from it, which is the whole reason that it exists, um, it's going to rupture eventually. And so, you know, I can see uh, sort of where the, uh, where I can see where the chips are getting ready to fall. So I'm, I'm expecting uh, some serious chaos going forward. So let's, yeah. let's hear what happens. So, um, you know, after the Second World War is over, uh, you know, you know, the, the Communist Party keeps going uh, and they organize the Civil Rights Congress. Um, that's one of their main activist groups is an activist group that fights for civil rights headed by W.E.B. Du Bois. Mm -hmm. uh, and they actually because the Soviet Union is a Security Council member at the U.N., they write a, a book called We Charge Genocide um, that exposes racism in the United States. And the Soviet Union presents it at the mm -hmm. UN as like an official UN document charging the US government and US society with genocide against black people. And that's like a huge moment, right? And that yeah. all the 
you know, black American communist leaders are speaking to the UN, exposing Jim Crow and lynching and racism. That's, that's huge. Um, uh, Harry Truman, who dropped the atomic bombs, he's the president. Um, and he's, you know, in, in an anti-communist frenzy and House on American Activities Committee and all of that. So in 1948, the Democrats that oppose the Cold War, oppose Jim Crow segregation, and oppose um, and and oppose the Taft Hartley anti labor law that had just come out. They form the Progressive Party and they run as a third party against the Democrats. And the Communist Party are the main like staffers of the Progressive Party campaign. And Henry Wallace is the candidate. Um, and Henry Wallace, um, you know, gets over a million votes. Uh, you um, know, mm -hmm. yeah, running uh, you know from the left against the Democrats against Harry Truman. Do you know that famous photo of you know Dewey defeats Truman? Yeah. Well, what that comes from is the fact that the Democratic vote was split three ways in that election, right? Because when the Progressive Party was formed, that split the Democratic vote, right? Because a lot of black pastors in the North were going to vote for Henry Wallace. A lot of labor activists were going to vote for Henry Wallace. So Harry Truman, you know, uh, realizing that he was going to lose a lot of black voters and a lot of progressive voters, integrated the U.S. armed forces with an executive order. Right. And that was huge. Right. That no more segregation in the army. So then the Dixiecrats formed the, and the Ku Klux Klan formed the National States Rights Party. Mm -hmm. So the Democrat vote was split three ways in the 1948 election, right? So yeah. the reason that that newspaper said Dewey defeats Truman is because there was no way in hell that Truman could have won that election because the, the left, you know, was voting for Henry Wallace. The racists were voting for, were voting for the National States Rights Party and Strom Thurmond. Um, so the Republicans should have won the 1948 election, except there was probably a lot of voter fraud that went on in a lot of areas, right? And mm -hmm. and Truman and the Democrats were able to actually to to win regardless. Um, but that was a big yeah. moment. It was really because of the Communist Party that the Democratic vote was split three ways. That's how much of an impact they had. By they asked Henry Wallace to run for president. Henry Wallace, you know, split the Democratic vote. The racists then split the Democratic vote again. And that was, even at a time of McCarthyism, when they were public enemy number one, they still had a huge impact, um, hmm. you know. And so 1948, uh, you know, uh, the Communist Party's leadership are put on trial at the famous Foley Square trial. Um, and the whole national board is convicted of, you know, plotting to overthrow the U.S. government. Um, and, you know, sent to prison. Uh, William Z. Foster, they end up not imprisoning him because of his health and because he's too old, and they end up, like, you know, not charging him, like, dropping charges against him. But Gus Hall, um, you know, all kinds of people, including, like, uh, you know, uh, Benjamin Davis, who's a city council member in New York City, uh, they, they all go to prison. Um, and the Communist Party is basically illegal. Uh, they use the Smith Act, which is a law that makes it illegal to teach the violent overthrow of the U.S. government or any ideology that could possibly lead someone to that conclusion um, because the Communist Party never advocated the violent overthrow of the government. They advocated a peaceful transition to socialism, but they warned the workers that, that you know, that may not be allowed and all that. But regardless, um, and in fact, you know, at the 1948 trial, uh, the conviction of the Communist Party members was largely based not on things they ever did or said, but on things that Lenin said. Uh, the book State and Revolution was the key piece of evidence. Really? Yeah, wow. it was it was pretty unbelievable. Um, so they're all you know convicted and going to prison, and the Communist Party basically starts to function as kind of an underground organization. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, you know they had a lot of secret members, and you know it was it was underground. Uh, the Korean War breaks out, and they managed to actually have a, a demonstration against the Korean War. Or they they got thousands of their members to go to Times Square and unfurl a banner, U.S. out of the Korean Peninsula, and then get charged, uh, you know, with, by the police, and then relocate, and then go down Broadway to the next square, um, <laughs> Madison Square, reconvene, and they did this, you know, and they, they did, you know, demonstrations against the Korean War, and they did some amazing stuff, um, you know, but they're still kind of operating underground. But William Z. Foster, at this time, he is, like, public enemy number one. Like, I mean, everything he does is, like, you know, news in the newspaper. He lives in the Bronx and he likes to go to the movies a lot. Um, and he goes to, you know, baseball games. Uh, he likes to go to Yankee stadium a lot, but, uh, you know, and he writes a lot of articles and, and, and he uses this time, I guess, to write five big history volumes. He writes the history of the communist party, the history of the trade union movement, uh, the history of black people in the United States, the history of the three internationals, which is probably the most educational book I've ever read. I've never learned so much. I learned from that book. 
Um, he writes Outline Political Histories of the Americas, which was probably the inspiration for Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States, because Howard Zinn was in the Communist Party during this time. And, and you know, and and it's weird because the Communist Party is public enemy number one. It's illegal. It's, you know, being attacked, but they, they still attract a lot of good people and a lot of good people join them. And the fact that they are the part of the civil rights movement is one of their the biggest arguments in their favor. Um, so then, you know, the this decade of craziness and the FBI hounding them and, you know, people going to prison and all that, it ends uh, really with uh, the death of Stalin, right? Mm -hmm. Stalin dies, uh, the Rosenbergs are executed, and the execution of the Rosenbergs was opposed by the Pope, and it was opposed by almost every European country, and the whole world was telling the United States, you really shouldn't execute the Rosenbergs, the United States government does it anyway. Um, on top of that, Joe McCarthy, you know, he's accusing, you know, U.S. senators and the U.S. Army of being communist infiltrated and a, a U.S. senator kills himself because of Joe McCarthy blackmailing him. And, and, you know, Joe McCarthy is kind of exposed by the American media and ends up drinking himself to death. Um, you know, and Stalin has died and the USA is talking, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's back channel communications between, you know, Khrushchev as Khrushchev is getting ready to take power. Uh, you know, but, you know, Khrushchev wants to negotiate with the United States. And so the United States is thinking we need to, you know, lighten up a little bit. So 1957, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court says it's legal to have a communist party uh, be as long as they don't advocate uh, the overthrow of the government. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there's a famous ruling Yates versus the United States where this guy says, look, I'm a member of the Communist Party, but I didn't advocate any violence. I never broke the law. I just was a member of the group. So why am I being charged and convicted? And the Supreme Court says, you know what? You're right. He didn't advocate it. So as long as the Communist Party does not advocate overthrow the U.S. government, it's legal. That's a Supreme Court ruling. That comes just after Khrushchev gave his secret speech. Um, and the, the infamous Khrushchev secret speech where, you know, he's condemning Stalin and saying, so, mm -hmm. so I, bo both empires are starting to open up essentially at this point. Yeah. So 1957, the communist party is finally able to have like a public event for like the first time, like in years. And so they have a, a public, uh, convention, they have their national convention and they're split into three factions. Um, there's <laughs> one faction is led by a guy named John, John Gates. And John Gates basically says that because of Stalin's secret speech, um, you know, we need to just um, we need to just drop Marxism, Leninism. We need to become an American Socialist Party, try to maybe merge with the Socialist Party of America. And we need to, to not be a, an explicitly Marxist Leninist group. We need to, you know, support the Soviet Union, but not really be a Soviet aligned party anymore. Just kind of be a general party that might be more sympathetic or whatever. That's John Gates faction. Um, and then there's. Gus Hall and Eugene Dennis, and they say, "Well, we need to remain aligned with the Soviet Union. We need to remain. Um, we need to remain um, a Marxist-Leninist party. But you know, we should stop supporting black nationalism, and instead, we should support Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and we should support integration. Um, and uh, we should uh, we should you know make clear uh, that uh, that we agree with Khrushchev that there should be no armed communist revolutions anywhere in the world because of the danger of nuclear war." Mm -hmm. And then you had William Z. Foster's faction, which was like the hardliner faction. And they said mm -hmm. that black people are, are a nation um, and constitute an oppressed nation within U.S. borders. They did not accept the secret speech and that they said that the Soviet Union was being a little bit too critical of Stalin and they didn't accept de-Stalinization. Um, and they were the, the hardliner faction, right? So mm -hmm. the Communist Party is divided, you know, three ways. Well, the convention, uh, the, the Gus Hall faction and the John Gates faction, you know, team up to defeat the William Z. Foster faction. A lot of the William Z. Foster people quit, but Foster stayed in the party and he went along with it. But a lot of his supporters quit and later laid the basis of the Maoist movement. Right. But the Communist Party mm -hmm. stopped supporting black nationalism, supported, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. and integration. Uh, the Communist Party uh, also at that point um, stopped, um, you know, it stopped, uh, you know, supporting groups around the world that might engage in revolution and calling for, you know, and, and so, you know, the Soviet, you know, so that position won out. And then John Gates, who was who was the leader of the faction that wanted to completely denounce Marxism, Leninism, he started publishing CIA propaganda in the Daily Worker, supporting the Hungarian uprising, uh, you know, the Hungarian revolts and, and the CIA. And so he was kicked out. So basically the Communist Party was down to about 2,000 members after that. Um, and, but William Z. Foster was still a member of the Communist Party, even though his faction had lost out. Uh, he was still a member of the Communist Party. He was older. Um, but And so he basically retired to the Soviet Union. He was having heart problems um, and uh, he was living in the Soviet Union. 
uh, to get medical care and all that. And his 80th birthday uh, was in 1961. He turned 80. Um, mm -hmm. So as a photo op, Khrushchev came to visit him in his hospital bed. Um, and what's amusing was that, that William Z. Foster and Mao had had like a very good relationship, like a back and forth. They would write each other letters and, and all of this. And Khrushchev had just officially cut ties with China, right? And the Sino-Soviet split was happening. So William Z. Foster is in his hospital bed and Khrushchev comes to visit him for his 80th birthday for like a photo op, right? Mm -hmm. and from his hospital bed, oh boy. William Z. Foster gives a speech in support of Mao. <laughs> And it's super awkward because yeah. he's the leader of the Soviet Union, right? Um, and and they just kind of it's super awkward, and they just kind of take the picture and leave, right? Um, and so you know he eventually dies a couple months later, um, and Khrushchev does not attend William Z. Foster's uh, you know his funeral in in Moscow because of that. Uh, Khrushchev is offended by it, but Brezhnev attends, and Brezhnev is the guy who eventually, you know, leads after Khrushchev. So Brezhnev is the guy who officiates William Z. Foster's memorial. Um, so it's quite a life, um, you know. Yeah. William Z. Foster was quite quite a figure. Um, if you look at, you know, everywhere that that he went and his life story, um, it's quite a dynamic individual. A lot of the Maoists, um, as the Maoist movement was getting going, honored William Z. Foster as the good communist leader, and 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 talked about browderism and accused the communist party of being a browderite party, uh, which is mm -hmm. interesting. But William C. Foster, he was, you know, he was Mr. Communism in the United States. And, um, you know, I mean, he lived quite a life. Um, and he's still very, very widely, um, widely hailed. Um, there was an older communist, I won't say his name, that I knew. Um, and he told me that his dad was in the communist party. And in the 1950s, one day they were driving through the Bronx. And they were just driving through the Bronx you know, to do something. And all of a sudden his father, who was a loyal communist party member, just stopped the car and it just like jerked to a stop. Right. And, and the, you know, he, the, the guy, I guess he was four or five years old. His dad's driving. They jerked the car to a stop. The dad gets out of the car because William Z. Foster was walking down the street <laughs> and his father was just like in awe. And, and he says, Mr. Foster, can I get you anything? And, you know, and he says, no, no, I'm fine or whatever. And, and he, and, you know, he just shook his hand and was just, in awe because William Z. Foster, he had that kind of like, you know, and, and, you know, the father then got back into the car and this son remembered this, this, I heard this story from, from a person who they said like, th this was like their, their father meeting like the Pope or mm -hmm. yeah, this, this was, and especially for people who'd been through McCarthyism and been yeah. through all of that. I mean, this man was, he was everything they were about, you know, I mean, this was, this was their leader and he was, he was held in but just extreme reverent awe as just kind of the, the leader of American communism. Um, and uh, he did have a memorial in New York City. Um, and it was held in, uh, in uh, uh, what is it, Carnegie Hall, right? Carnegie Hall. Over a thousand people attended. And it was protested by George Lincoln Rockwell and the American Nazi Party. Of course. And they were outside in their Nazi outfits with a sign that said, one less dead rat or one less red rat, um, <sighs> you know. Yeah. Uh, but William Z. Foster, he was, you know, he was the symbol of American communism for many decades, you know, from the, the 19, I mean, in the 1920s, but especially in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, uh, he was the symbol of American communism. Um, and what's interesting is also in his old age, when he was in his 70s, uh, Jay Fox, the anarchist who he'd been close with, was also quite old and they started hanging out again. And, oh, that's wonderful. And, yeah, <laughs> that was like his, they became like good friends again. And Jay Fox was always over at his apartment, which I think is sweet. Um, yeah. One of his last books uh, is called The Twilight of World Capitalism. Um, and uh, the dedication is it's to his grandson. Uh, he says, to my grandson, Joseph Stanley Kolko, who will live in a Soviet America. And I thought that was very sweet. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was... He was uh, somebody who really gave years and years of his life uh, to the vision of, of building socialism in the United States. Yeah, I, he's a fascinating man, I've really got to say. And, you know, if you get a, a monster like uh, George Lincoln Rockwell protesting your funeral, you did something very good. <laughs> um, you know, you were doing something right there. Um, what's fascinating about this, I guess, is with my standard American education, I'm more educated than most. Uh, I had no idea that the United States was as authoritarian as it, it, it 
seems to have come across in this story. Like I wasn't even aware that uh, it was that particular case. Um, the one, uh, the one that went up to the Supreme court uh, that said, okay, well we can't outlaw you for simply being a communist. I'd taken that, I think as a given that that was, you know, yeah, constitutional yeah. in the United States. The United States was the ruling. Yeah. 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 Um, I think that, uh, you know, Overall, the, the guy definitely led a fascinating life. Um, I, I love that. Um, what I kept coming back to, by the way, is like, so how e how educated was he? Like from never not in high school. Wow. Yeah. Because normally, at least in a lot of radical circles that I find, um, you know, there needs to often be a certain level of education to get the person to start to think outside of the box, start to think critically, you know, um, a, a big reason as to why I am no longer conservative was I went to college, you know? Um, and, uh, I was, a, I was exposed to viewpoints that were different than the viewpoints that I grew up with. And to then, you know, I spent a lot of time traveling and met a lot of people and, lived in numerous different areas and all of that kind of combined to get me into the headspace that I am, you know, now in today, along with a lot of reading. And it can be very difficult to wrap your head around radical politics. It, it took me years to understand anarchism and, um, you know, uh, and socialism. There's a lot of, uh, and, you know, Marxism to the degree that I do there, there's a lot of, and somebody who can come in without, a high school education and can figure that out and not only figure that out on their own, you know, essentially as an autodidact, but they're able to have the charisma uh, and the vision and the follow through to get that many people moving in the, in the, the same direction. I think it, ironically, it's a, it's a very American story. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, I mean, you have to remember, though, I mean, this was a time when, you know, the everyone having a college degree is a very new development, right, mm -hmm. in American history, you know, and that it, it used to be there were a lot of people who didn't graduate high school, who didn't, didn't you know, ever graduate, go to college, you know, that was much more common, um, you know, and they talk about education inflation over the, over the generations, that's a very common uh, thing. Mm -hmm. but, you know, the main thing is that William Z. Foster's skill was as an organizer. I mean, he knew how to organize people um, and yeah. get people moving. Um, and he learned that with the Wobblies and then with the Syndicalist League of North America and the International Trade Union Educational League and then in the Communist Party, you know. Um, and he was over 40 years old by the time he joined the Communist Party, you know, um, you know, and that his political development. One thing about Foster was that he was always developing uh, mm -hmm. you know, and that he he was willing to. And this is the interesting thing, because, you know, um, people who didn't like him in the Communist Party would often say, you know, the Z in his name stands for zigzag. Um, you know, uh, because he would often reverse himself. But I think that that shows that he was willing to change positions and recognize yeah. he was wrong and that he was very much, there's a pragmatism that you'll see in his life where it's mm -hmm. like, hey, I want to actually get something done. So I'm going to go join the AFL. You know, I want to stay in my position in the AFL. I'm going to support World War One. Okay, I'm going to join the Communist Party because the communists, you know, you know, or, or the Soviet Union is the party that exists. Oh, yeah, you, you know, you see kind of a pragmatism there, right? And yeah. there to to you know, he had these radical beliefs that he, you know, he discovered. I mean, he he heard the soapbox box agitator one day, joined the Wobblies, but he had a real commitment to be connected to something real and to really make them happen. Um, and I think that I think that that's why probably. He became, you know, the tanky, right? I mean, he was the Soviet guy, but that was probably because he said, "Look, the Soviet Union really exists," you know, and I want to tie. Yeah. Um, the the idea that it's one of the things that I actually learned, like, um, you know, working with my Buddhist organization, for instance, with Soka Gakkai International, um, is that I, I had I got into it with a, a friend of mine who I had invited to um, one of our our, our meetings. And he was like, you know, oh, you're spending a lot of time recruiting. And I'm like, well, yeah, we're trying to accomplish these goals. We're trying to make life better for everybody. And to do that, you need to have an organization and you need to have people. That you, you, it's not enough to simply want to do that and to have the individual effort. You, you have to build something. There must be an institution. And so, you know, when we did our uh, 50,000 youth 
uh, across the United States, like we met up in huge uh, stadiums. Um, and suddenly I'm looking up and I'm seeing, I think you even uh, commented on this on my Facebook. Uh, this was a couple of years ago, but I'm looking up and, and, you know, I'm surrounded by people in the, uh, in the crowds and I'm looking up at the uh, projector and I'm seeing the words again that we saw at Occupy. Another world is possible. And this wasn't a handful of activists in Zuccotti Park saying it. This was 50,000 youth linked up across, I don't know, 12 different cities. Um, you know, and it's the ability to get that many people moving in, in a positive direction outside of you know what the, the major party institutions is it, it, it's almost unthinkable just because of the political situation in the united states um so i feel like you know oftentimes people will move in the direction of more idealism over function and I mean that in the literal ideas over function, that if I can adopt this idea and if I can live this idea, I can somehow just project that out into the world and it, and it will catch on. Um, and it seems to me that Foster understood that, you know, change doesn't just happen. You have to actually do it. And yeah. he had the, um, the drive and the follow through to actually do it. So, yeah, it, it's definitely something that I'm shocked at. I'm also, by the way, to jump back to when you talked about the uh, meat uh, packing and and the the meat strike, it seemed like he was doing his best to organize um, between the meat and the steel. He's trying to unionize things that are necessary for the war effort. Yeah, which is you know it's their best chance when they have the most bargaining power, but also when there's the most forces allayed against them. Because like um, if you look at my channel, uh, we've got uh, Bobby B of the Five by Five now Mustache Mafia podcast that I have on quite often, and we've been doing a series on homage to Catalonia by George Orwell. Um, we're about six chapters in, and one of the things that we keep coming back to, uh, both because Orwell comes to it, and also because you know Bobby uh, was in the service. Um, is that like an army marches on its stomach and that, you know, amateurs talk about tactics, um, you know, professionals talk about logistics. Mm -hmm. And so it, it makes a lot of sense that during World War I, essentially what he's doing is he's messing with the logistics and trying to, not in a um, way that's trying to hurt the war effort, but to make sure that the people who are actually uh, contributing to this war effort are, are rewarded reasonably. And, you know, it's an incredibly gutsy thing to do because, you know, there probably were knives out for him uh, then. But, you know, and you even see he managed to arrange for um, big changes in the meat industry. He failed initially with the steel, but that, that, that push that he made for it, I guarantee you, set the stage for the American steel workers eventually unionizing. So. Right. Um, and you know, I mean, that's one thing when you look over his life, it becomes really, I mean, it's, it's really hard to imagine how difficult it was to build the industrial union movement in the United mm -hmm. States. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. And that comes across, I mean, when you, when you look at his life, that it was, it was decades and decades of struggle and a lot of deaths just to get industrial unions recognized. Um, and that comes across and that, uh, you know, William Z. Foster, he, you know, he was somebody who was in the labor movement. Uh, he was a, a very dedicated organizer. He ended up being, you know, the, the leader of American communism. Um, and uh, it, it's his writing, I will say, is astoundingly good. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably why I, I like him the most is that I came, I got my hands on his book Toward Soviet America when I was in high school. And it was the most clear, basic, to the point introduction to communism uh, that I'd ever read, right? It was not incoherent at all. It was very clear, very, you know, very short sentences, very concise points. He just laid it out there. Right. Um, and he was a very, very skilled writer. Um, and if you read any of his pamphlets or, or booklets, he, he really has a way of, of making communist ideas very, very accessible. And, and that one of the problems I think with leftism in our time is that the influence of academia is so big and in academia, often people don't try to make things accessible. You almost get yeah. more points for making it inaccessible. Um, and the same can be said for Earl Browder. Earl Browder's writing style is also very accessible. Um, and that they, they had a way of, of, you know, they were organizing 
millions of people, a lot of whom might not have even been literate, right, at that time, you know, in the United States. And, uh, you know, they, they had a way of, of putting forward Marxist ideas in a very clear and coherent, um, in a very clear and coherent way. And the writing that, that comes out of that period, the books that they published are very, very, uh, are very educational. And his book, The History of the Three Internationals, is it's a long book, but it's probably the most, uh, I have never learned as much as I learned from that book. I mean, I learned about Marx's, you know, fight with the anarchists. I learned about <laughs> the Second International and the Social Democrats. I learned about Lenin and the Third International. It goes from like the French Revolution all the way up to World War II. And it's, it is a very, very good history. Um, you know, and, and I mean, it is a history mm -hmm. of the Marxist movement. Uh, from from you know from the time of of Marx to the time of Stalin, um, and it's very very good. Um, and uh, you know, and that he said that he one thing he did regret is he felt he didn't dedicate enough time to studying. Um, and I thought that was interesting. Um, and the other thing is that that his relationship with Mao Zedong was also rather interesting. And I gave a class uh, last year called Mao and American Socialists. And I actually talked about the parallel between the Mao faction of the Chinese Communist Party and the Foster faction of the American Communist Party, because they seemed to almost parallel each other. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Mao had been an anarchist before he joined the Chinese Communist Party. He had been kind of an outlier, you know, not popular. But then around the same time, 1928, he became the leader of Chinese communism. And that and the fact that, you know, when Earl Browder was defeated at, uh, by William Z. Foster, Mao sent a personal telegram to William Z. Foster congratulating him on the defeat of Earl Browder. Uh, they had a relationship. <laughs> the fact that that you know the last big thing William Z. Foster ever did was shout at Khrushchev over Mao. That's pretty big, you know. Yeah. I mean, and they were almost they, Mao and and William Z. Foster were kind of kindred spirits in a weird way. Um, there's a lot of good biographies that have been published. Uh, there's a good book called um, William Z. Foster and the Tragedy of American Radicalism. Uh, there's a book, book called Working Class Giants, uh, the biography of William Z. Foster. Uh, there's also a very good book called uh, Forging American Communism. Which, that is probably the best biography of William Z. Foster because it uses his FBI files. Um, mm -hmm. So, And the FBI watched him like a hawk, <laughs> as you can imagine. And yeah, so, I definitely think, especially, you know, if he's messing with the, the war industry stuff like I, right, like I brought up. Right. So you really get like an intimate portrait of who he was on a personal level. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, and that, that, that book is particularly good. Um, he wrote two autobiographies. One is a formal autobiography called From Brian to Stalin, which is about, you know, and it's actually, there's very little about him in it. It's all just about politics. It's like mm -hmm. different political groups he was in and how he ended up being in the Communist Party. But the book, Pages from a Worker's Life, is just little anecdotes. It's like stories that he told. And, you know, it was like someone was interviewing him in his old age and they just typed out all these little stories. And it's not in chronological order. It's by topic. Right. Uh -huh. and, and it's like they had the stories of from being in prison. You have the stories from being in, uh, you know, from being in the trade union movement. You have the stories from being in the Soviet Union. You have the story. And, and, and that's particularly good. Um, and what's good about it is that you get a sense that he was a storyteller mm -hmm. very much like, he, you know, and that's what he was known for is that he would entertain people by telling stories. And he had a lot of little anecdotes and, and funny little things that happened. Um, one thing he would urge people to do was to be a Jimmy Higgins. Um, because apparently in, uh, there's a novel by Upton Sinclair where the hero is a guy named Jimmy Higgins, uh, who's just a very dedicated socialist who works very hard. And William Z. Foster, you know, would tell people, you need to be a Jimmy Higgins. You need to, to be, you know, very, very dedicated and work really hard and be kind of the unsung hero of the movement. Um, and he also talked about um, that it, one thing that people remember about William Z. Foster is he used the word working class uh, as an adjective. And it mm -hmm. was a positive adjective. Uh, if someone was doing something right, he would say, now that's a, that's the working class approach. Right. Um, and he and and that was that was a way of talking uh, that the communist movement he kind of popularized that we're saying working class was an adjective and, and a positive adjective. You know, that is the working class way of doing things. That is that is the working class statement that you just made. Um, you know, and I, I think that's kind of sweet as well. Yeah. Well, you know what? There's something that I wanted to is we've been at this for a while, so we should probably wrap it up soon. Yeah. But yeah. there is something that I wanted to, to point out. And you were talking about like his writing and how accessible it is. Yeah. Um, and also like people don't understand how powerful writers are. And I, and I say that as a writer, and I know every profession is like, every, people don't understand how great my profession is. But like, I was watching, for instance, um, the the beginnings of that, uh, I forget what it's called, the, the thing on that 
cult Nexium, you know, um, run by that Keith Raniere guy. And looking at Keith Raniere and his philosophy and how he manipulated people and everything, I noticed that there is something that keeps coming up. Ayn Rand. Uh, and the and Keith Raniere was a fan of Ayn Rand, and he used yeah. objectivism to essentially, you know, brainwash people in his particular cult. And Ayn Rand was not a good writer; like her prose is atrocious. the um, uh, the The books themselves are just awful. But she is a she is a very effective writer, and the art that she created is one of the most evil things <laughs> and one of the most per pernicious things to affect human culture ever since those books were mm -hmm. ever written. Um, and there's some truth to it too, because it, it has to, for art to be effective, it must also speak to something true right. about the human condition. And Ayn Rand's case, I think it's sort of the aggrieved sense of being like the one smart person in a group of idiots you know, um, that every slightly too smart 13 year old child suddenly thinks they are. And oftentimes are, you know, and so they get suckered by the stuff like that. Um, but you can see just the, the power of communication and the power of human language. Um, one of the, my favorite writers, um, uh, who, um, wrote, uh, V for Vendetta, Alan Moore, um, and, you know, also Watchmen and a number of other things. Um, and is one of the people that I look up to in a big way. He uh, has this position that essentially art and writing is literally magic, as in it is the manipulation of symbols, letters, words, you know, to, and images to create a change in consciousness in the world. And he actually... Uh, feels that writers and artists uh, have been sold this false bill of goods by the capitalist society to say that we are entertainers, you know, when in fact we're something closer to shamans. And you can really see that with William Z. Foster, that he was able to reach across time and communicate with Caleb Maupin yeah. in a way, and, you know, it's something that, that you got. So I, I think one of the things, one of the takeaways from this is the, the, incredible impact that just one person can have on the world but also you know the the real impact that uh, i've kind of poo-pooed ideology and, and idealism in this in the sense that but you know if you are able to take what's in your head and have it take actual physical form in reality either through action or through art um you know you stand a good chance of altering the world for better or worse. And I think that, you know, um, people need to realize that, that there is a, a certain responsibility with that. And you can either be the, the guy who, um, goes and, uh, found something like George Lincoln Rockwell and goes and uh, protests an old man's funeral, um, at Carnegie hall, or you can be the guy who, funeral is being protested by that, you know, evil yeah. son of a bitch. <laughs> thing that, that is interesting to me is I've often on my lives talked about, you know, we have no idea who that soapbox agitator in 1909, mm -hmm. William C. Foster encountered was, you know, we have no yeah. idea who it was. Um, but that person made William Z. Foster a communist, mm -hmm. you know, or an anarchist or a revolutionary, you know? Um, and, you know, think about that, right? If that person had said, you know, that day, you know, I don't feel like going out today. I go out every day and no one ever listens to me. I'm just not going to do it. Think of how di different the world would be, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, and I mean, y you never really know what you're accomplishing, right? There's no, you know, with business, right? It's like I sold this many. I got, you don't know that when it comes to this kind of work because you're trying to change the way people think. and. Yeah people might hear you say something and then it might take them two or three years to realize just how right you were. Um, you know, um, another thing is, you know, you mentioned how these free speech fights and things like that were very key and, and all of that, because, you know, there's a, there's another very famous person. Uh, you, do you know, Dr. Norman Bethune? You know I've heard the name. I'm not familiar though. He was a Canadian doctor and this was around the same period of wealthy Canadian doctor uh, who was walking somewhere. And he saw a group of workers that were protesting for jobs and for unemployment councils, and they were being beaten up. So being a doctor, he went to give them medical care, and the police swooped him up and arrested him 
uh, and took him to jail. So he was in the jail and he talked to the workers and they convinced him to become a communist. So he ended up going to Spain um, and being a doctor in Spain uh, with the International Brigades. He then ended up going to, to China and working with China against the Japanese invaders. Um, and then he cut his hand and he got an infection and he died. And Dr. Norman Bethune is like a saint in China. And Mao gave a speech at Dr. Norman Bethune's memorial. Um, and that speech was one of Mao's most treasured, the five most treasured essays of Mao Zedong. Um, there are like movies about his life in China. And Dr. Norman Bethune is this like, you know, really well-loved figure. I think the Chinese government has like paid for like a monument to him in Canada. Um, you know, like, I mean, he is just like, he's, he's, you know, a very, very well-loved figure, but all of that could have changed if he hadn't, you know, seen the, the workers getting beaten up and went to give them medical care and then ended up in the jail, you know, and mm -hmm. a lot of times like little events like that can just change everything. Right. Um, and that a lot of times, um, you know, people's lives go one way or they go another and, uh, you know, who knows? Um, and the communist movement is like that. You know, there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, kind of almost wander into it accidentally and never leave, you know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's kind of funny that way. Street with its fascist-like Taft Hartley bill also wants to kill the Communist Party. But they will fail in this as in their other anti-labor objectives. The workers, the American people, need a strong Communist Party and it will be built despite Wall Street profiteers and exploiters. You have heard William Z. Foster, chairman of the Communist Party, which purchased the foregoing 15 minutes. Uh -huh.